Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Laura Gassner Otting. I will tell you all about Laura in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, the courage we exert for others. Uh, and when you do it as a leader, as you will definitely discover that Laura is, you do it with the purpose of bringing people together for common cause. Laura Gassner Odding, welcome to Grace Under Pressure for the second time. Yes, so. thank you, John. I'm so excited to be here on the, you know, the precipice of my book coming out. Yours is coming out soon. We've got book babies. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, so this is exciting. I want to tell folks about you. Uh, Laura is an executive coach, an uh, entrepreneur, and I like the word she says. She's a catalyst. What she means is she makes th things happen, good things happen. Um, she has uh, experience in the White House, uh, built her own business. She's a strategic thinker, a wise person, and she works for both profit and nonprofit. And the reason we're talking today is she has a brand new book out called Wonder Hell, which I think is fabulous. And I can't wait to have Laura talk about it. Welcome, Laura. So, Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm excited again to all things wonder and all things hell. <laughs> well, that's good. So, Here's, I have to read something because this kind of sums it up. It says, have you ever accomplished something you weren't sure you could do? It's exciting, incredible, amazing, wonderful, right? And then something happens. <laughs> Anxiety, stress. So what the heck is wrong, Laura? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, this, I wrote this book because I found myself in wonder hell, right? Like my last book had come out. It was a Washington Post bestseller, number two on the list. And I was like, that's amazing. That's exciting. It's humbling. It's wonderful. I wonder how I get to be number one on the list. <laughs> and, and, and normally I would never even think about that, but in the exhaustion of book launch that, you know, we're in right now. So, you know, all of the hustle and the madness that goes into book launch, the part of my brain that normally governs my humility was like shh, gone. And yeah. I heard this voice in my head going, how can you get to number one? This thing could have legs. What if it could be bigger? What if you could be bigger? And suddenly I saw this image of myself and I kid you not, it was an image of me under the oak tree talking to Oprah. Now I have not been under the oak tree talking to Oprah, but I saw myself there. And in that moment, I saw an aversion, a version of myself I didn't know was possible. I saw a potential that I didn't know existed. And then the burden of that potential sat on my shoulders and said to me like, hey, what else you got for me? Like, what can you do now that you've seen that you've got this potential in you? And all of a sudden, the, the, the joy and the excitement and the wonder turned into stress and anxiety and uncertainty and imposter syndrome and doubt and fear. So it was wonderful. And it was hell. It was wonder hell. But wonder hell is that space in your psyche where you figure out you're made for more and you have to figure out what you're going to do with the possibility. Well, you are dealing with serious subjects, but you're, you have a sense of whimsy about you. And that's why I want to show the book cover uh, because um, it kind of, it reminds me of, uh, I don't know, is it Coney Island? Is it Las Vegas? <laughs> is it whatever, but it's an imaginative color. I love the colors and the sign wonder hell. So is there a story behind this um, uh, design at all, Laura, that you want to share? Sure. There absolutely is. So um, I, I early on, I was talking to our mutual friend, Rahaf Harfouche, who's part of the 100 coaches with us, the Marshall Goldsmith 100. And she said, you know, she's like, it's kind of like an amusement park, you know, like you think that entrepreneurship and leadership and success is going to be the straight journey. But really, it's like an amusement park where there's these different towns and we're all in different places at different towns. And it's like, I wish there was a map that said, like, you are here. And the more we talked about it, I was like, yeah, it's like you think success is going to be fun. It's going to be amazing. Like you can't wait to get there like the amusement park. And then it's three o'clock in the afternoon and the sun is beating down on your shoulders and that corn dog in your stomach is making a threat for the exit and you're dehydrated and everyone's cranky. And you're like, I thought this was supposed to be fun. Kind of like success. I thought when I got here, it would be fun. Why isn't it fun? Why is it harder than I thought? And so the book is organized uh, like an amusement park. There's three towns. Imposter Town, Doubtsville, and Burnout City. And in each of the three towns, there are five rides, each of which are supposed to emulate the emotions that we're feeling as we're feeling this tsunami of emotions coming at us when we're not even sure what we're experiencing. 
And that's the gem of this book. You, you This could be a very dry, carefully, I mean, it's research, it's stories, it, it resonates there, but you have a sense of humor. And that's why the book is compelling. And I think it's going to make, uh, it's number one in my mind right now. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's so many books out there about success and about happiness, and they all kind of follow a very similar path. And, you know, they either say things like, you got to hustle harder, like rise and grind, crush it, lean in. Or they say like, stop apologizing and wash your face. <laughs> and, 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 and when I found myself in Wonder Health, I read every one of those books and mm -hmm. none of them helped me. None of them because yeah. all of them are geared to this idea that like, if you just lean in, if you hustle harder, if you just wash your face, once you're successful, it'll all be fine, but you just got to get through this one moment. And what I realized as I talked to people, I talked to a hundred different glass ceiling shatterers, Olympic medalists, startup unicorns, everyday people like you and me. And what I realized is that none of them got to the other side because on the other side, of this wonder hell is just the next one and the next one and the next one after that. So I was like, well, if we're going to be stuck in wonder hell forever, amazing. What a like a fabulous privilege. We might as well have fun while we're doing it. So how do we not just survive these moments, but learn how to look forward to them and plan for them and learn from them and thrive in them instead. And so I couldn't write a book that was dry. I had to write a book that was fun also, because if we're going to be there, we should really enjoy the ride. Well, your first chapter is called Imaginarium, which is imagining the bigger self of you. What what does that mean? Um, uh, is it ego? Is it uh, ambition? What is it? A bigger me? So yeah, I mean, it can be ego. It can be ambition. You know, we're told like, oh, don't have a big ego, and oh, like ambition's a dirty word. And I'm here to tell you, like, I think those things are great because John, like. If you had more money, more time, more privilege, more leverage, more power, more connections, couldn't you do more for the causes that you love? Couldn't you show up better for the people who you held dear? Like, of course you could. So why are we saying that ambition is a dirty word, right? Like ambition to, to be able to be the very best version of ourselves, to, to, to have enough uh, – I have enough ego that we want to show up as the very best version of, our, of ourselves every single day. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So in the Imaginarium is where you walk in and you see this new version of yourself. And what I learned from 20 years of executive search is that every internal candidate who interviews for the job but doesn't get it always eventually leaves. Now, sometimes it's because the organization treats them terribly. Sometimes it's because they bring in somebody who's not qualified from the outside. But mostly it's because in this moment of interviewing for that bigger job, they literally have to wear the clothes of that role, speak in the voice of that role, answer questions in the mindset of that role. And once they see part of themselves in that bigger role, they can't unsee it. And so that's the imaginarium. Once you see yourself, once you see that potential, you can't unsee it. And here's the sneaky thing about Wonder Hell. I believe that that potential, that wonder hell only shows itself to people who are worthy of it. So if you didn't have that ego, if you didn't have that ambition, you wouldn't actually see that greater potential. You'd be just complacent and happy where you are, which is fine. We all get to a point where we're like, yep, this is where I am. But for the rest of us who are constantly growing and changing and are still in that evolution, I say welcome to wonder hell. Congratulations, <laughs> right? Like, I'm glad you're here. You embrace it. Alone. <laughs> well, you you talk um, about it. And the next one is the fortune teller. And you talk about luck. And um, I, the, the quote I know about luck is, I think it was uh, Vince Lombardi said that luck is the residue of desire. So uh, is that what you're getting at? Or you have science behind this luck. So what does that mean, Laura? Yeah, I love that. Luck is the residue of desire. Um, Okay, so this was one of my favorite chapters to write. It's the fortune teller, right? Like, how do you make your own luck? And I also talk about manifestation because I was like, I don't know. That seems like BS to me. Like, what's manifestation? <laughs> I was like, I need to look into this because people that I respect believe in manifestation. So there has to be some science. And so what I realized, two things. Number one, there is actually science behind manifestation. And number two, you can actually make yourself luckier. So there are ways that you can, like people aren't just born lucky. You can make yourself luckier by acting like a lucky person acts. Mm -hmm. And how do lucky people act? They say yes to things. 
they see um, negatives and they turn them into positives. Like, oh, I failed at this thing. That's a learning opportunity. Let me keep going. They put themselves in the deal flow. They have an optimistic attitude, right? They, they go out to events. They meet people. They, you know, they act extroverted. Now, as we talked about before we started recording, I'm an introvert. I am not an extrovert. I don't go to the events. I don't say yes. I don't work the room. But when I want to make myself luckier about certain things, I will act like a situational extrovert. I'm like an extrovert tourist. So I go and I pretend to be an extrovert for like yeah. for 45 minutes of the event. And then I go home and I like get in fetal position with my dog and watch Netflix. But, <laughs> so you don't have to, so you don't have to be an extrovert, but you can act extrovert. So I just want to make sure I'm clear about that. So that's the first part. The second part is how manifestation works. Our brains get 11 million bits of data every single second, 11 million, but it can only process 50. And those things are like, what's the temperature in the room? Is that the air conditioning I hear? I wonder what time the mailman is coming. Like there's a billion things that are going into our brain. We could only process 50. So the science behind manifestation is if you intentionally say to yourself, say out loud, write it on scrolly, you know, font on your vision board, say it to a friend, post about it on social media. You are signaling to your brain to intentionally pick out that bit of data out of the 11 million that are coming. So if you want to fly to Japan and you can't afford to go and you write down and you cut out beautiful pictures of, you know, Japan, Tokyo and put them on your vision board, all of a sudden the next day you see a bus go by with half off prices to Japan. Did you manifest that bus into a period? Yeah. No, but you told your brain to notice it. That bus has probably been going by you for a year. So you can make yourself luckier by being intentional, by thinking about these things, by putting yourself out there, by saying these things out loud. And so that to me was fascinating because I think so many of us think that we're like a victim of our circumstances when in fact we create our circumstances. I want to put a little pin in this. When we use, when you're using the word manifest, is it the same as imagining or visioning it? Is that how you're describing it? Okay. Yeah. Like, sure. you know how people are like, I manifested my perfect mate, right? Or I manifested the perfect job. It's like, well, you didn't. You might have thought very hard about what your perfect mate would be like or what the perfect job would be. And then the practice of writing that down, the exercise of thinking through it, of, of, of telling other people that that's what you're looking for, that signals to your brain, hey brain, pick these things out of everything that's out there. So manifesting, imagining, desiring, all of it's all interchangeable. That's great. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you, Laura. And it's, it's, don't worry, it's only live because I know you're really not that good. You really don't belong here. So what do you do about that little voice in your head that says that, Laura? <laughs> so. Oh, my God. So this was the, like the, the most crushing realization that I had in these hundred interviews that I did was that nobody ever got rid of imposter syndrome. I mean, I talked to people who were like gold medal winners. I talked to people who are running billion dollar companies and they all still had imposter syndrome. And I was like, ah, that wasn't the answer that I wanted. Yeah. But here's what I learned instead. Imposter, first of all, let's talk about the gall of the term imposter syndrome itself. You're an imposter, you should leave. You have a <laughs> syndrome. You must be sick. Maybe you should lay down, right? Just like the idea of the, the, the terminology itself is like, you're the problem. So we should get rid of you as opposed to the, you know, the, the, the world in which you are living, right? Like I walk into a C-suite of a, of a fortune 10 company and that C-suite wasn't built by people who look like me for people who look like me. I'm a cisgendered white female, but if you're not, right? Like I'm, I've got about as much privilege as not being a cisgendered white male as I can get. But yeah. I mean, the, the, the places of power are not built for the people who are coming up the ranks right now. And so of course we all have a lot of imposter syndrome. That's number one. Number two, the very idea of imposter syndrome, we think of as this, like these slings and arrows that we have to absorb and feel badly about when in fact, we should be congratulating ourselves for feeling imposter syndrome. Anytime I've ever felt imposter syndrome, it's because I have been in a room that I never thought I was going to get myself into. Like I could walk in and say, oh no, they're going to find me out. I shouldn't be here. Or I could say, this is amazing. I'm so yeah. glad I'm here. Right. I, so, I'm, yeah. yeah. So I think we have to change the way that we interpret the feelings from like, oh my God, I haven't done this before to, oh my God, I haven't done this before. 
Right. Do you still feel well, it? Do you still feel imposter syndrome? I, I think, well, do I, of course I do. But yeah. here's, um, but um, the thing about imposter syndrome, I think of it as a positive in the sense that it's a check on our ego, yeah. and it's I, I, there's an analogy about the the only uh, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the only people who are not afraid in dangerous situations are fools. And same thing applied to uh, imposter syndrome. I mean, it's sure. just, it's, it's a good check on us. Um, now you interviewed so many people. Is there a story that you have about someone told you an imposter story that um, you want to share? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but yeah, you know, I mean, you really don't belong here, Laura. So come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there are so, there are so many of them, but you know, my, my favorite story, I think is probably Sally Krawcheck and Sally Krawcheck <laughs> runs Elevate down and it runs Elevest, you know, uh, $2 billion under management. It is a, an investment company for women, uh, by women, for women. Sally ran Smith Barney. Sally was high up in, you know, a bunch of different banks on Wall Street. She's the only person who's been fired not once but twice on the cover of the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, right? She's like, I'm very proud of that um, because she was a woman on Wall Street, not because she had female parts, but because she would stand in these C-suite offices and she would say, you know, I know that, you know, the guys here want to like run fast and loose with the investment, but like, what about risk? What about nuance? What about long-term? And she said, I thought like a woman thinks about in investing. And so they fired me because they didn't like that. That wasn't fun for them. Um, right. And so she said one day she was putting on mascara in front of the mirror. She's like, I'm there. I am putting on mascara. Mm -hmm. She's like, and I was thinking to myself, the retirement crisis is really a woman's crisis because women retire later than men. Women live longer than men. Women don't invest as much as men. We're given different messages about money than men. We need to solve this problem. If only there was someone who understood Wall Street, who understood how women think, who could stand up to the, 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 the bad boys and who could also deal with the pressure of public embarrassment. If only there was someone who could do that. And she's like putting on her mascara and she was like, oh, it's me. Literally the only person on the planet who could do it. And still she had massive imposter syndrome about doing this, but she had to, she had to, to, to pull up her ego and say, you know what, this problem has to be solved. And I'm the only one who can do it. So I guess we're going forward. Thank you for sharing that story. And I'm glad it, uh, you chose the, um, uh, story of, from, about a very successful woman who, despite all her accomplishments, three accomplishments <laughs> in the sense of three running three different businesses, finally starting her own, is that even she felt it, and yeah. we all do, and so it's human. So now, okay, I would say it's a sign that we're on the right track. Yeah, good. Now, there's something else that e eats at us, and you call it, or we call it, um, the people-pleasing mode. So what's wrong with that? And I think it's not healthy for us. Am I correct, Laura? <laughs> well, I think it's not healthy for us if we're p p pleasing people at the detriment of our own desires. So I think a lot of times we, we sacrifice what we really want to make other people happy. Um, and that can come in a lot of different forms. It most often comes in the form of how we define success, right? We define success as I'll become a lawyer because my father wanted me to. I'll become a teacher because my mother wanted me to. I'm going to marry this person or wear that size or live in this house or send my kids to that school because so-and-so told me I had to do it. And so we spend a lot of time pleasing other people, filling in all the boxes on everybody else's you know, checklist only to get to the end and go, okay, well, the boxes are all full. Why do I still feel empty? And it's because we're filling in someone else's checklist. So I think that the the problem with trying to please other people is that we just we don't actually find ourselves. We don't actually find who we are in in, in our truest form. So, you know, I I there's a there's a chapter in the book. I think that's the haunted house chapter. Where I talk about letting go of your demons, right, and like yeah. letting go of everybody else and 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 choosing yourself which I know sounds kind of selfish, but the truth is that when you choose yourself and you, you, you live into the fullest version of who you are, that benefits everybody else around you because you're bringing your very best to everyone around you. You know, you, and I want to go jump back to something you talked about ambition and embracing it. And sadly women, uh, as you would know better than yeah. I sublimate their ambition because 
men want them to. And good, good gracious Sally Kotick didn't do that. <laughs> but the other side of that, you mentioned a very positive concept, which I think needs to be linked to it. And it's becoming our best self. And you mentioned it again. Uh, and that's, I think that's a key connection that you make. So I wanted to give you a shout out for that. So. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, one of the, the the chapters in the book is the tent of oddities, right? It's the uh, it's living into your truest self. And there's a story I tell about a woman named um, uh, Lydia Finette who runs. She's basically she runs Christie's auction house. Um, nonprofit auction. She has raised half a billion with a B, half a billion dollars for nonprofits. And when she first went to Christie's. She walked in and she saw all these like suited, staid, very proper, very English old men doing the auctions. And so she started doing them just like them. Now, she's not old. She's not male. She's not British. She's definitely not suited and staid. And then one day when she was like 11 months pregnant, she as she was going on stage, she happened to make this like self-deprecating joke. And she noticed everybody in the audience laughed and perked up. And then she was like, oh, well, then she made another joke and another joke. And she was more successful at that auction than any auction she'd done before that. And she was like, oh, wait a minute. You mean I can just be me? And if I'm just me, it's more authentic and more successful. And I learned the same lesson when I was speaking. I used to go out and I used to try to like do the thing and pretend to be the TED talker. And finally, <laughs> one day somebody said to me, a good friend of mine was like, I sent him a video of me speaking and I said, I'd love some feedback. And he said, do you want feedback or do you want praise? Because those are two different things. I was like, no, no, I want feedback. And he's like, okay, here's the feedback. I don't know what you were doing for those first five minutes of the talk, but don't ever do that again. I, who, who was that? I didn't like you when you did that. Yeah. Then you started telling me the story about how you met your kids in the first day of school and your definition of success. And I was like, there she is, the yeah. LPO I know and love. Do that. And I was like, I can just do that? And he's like, yes, just be you. It's like, oh. Well, while we're on a high note, let's get real because you have a chapter called Bumper Cars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so um, what's that all about? And so, so the bumper cars, look, we everybody makes a plan. And the plan is like, I'm going to go straight. Right? I'm going to go straight. Everything's going to be perfect. And then boom, somebody comes and knocks you off course. Right? So that's the bumper cars. And that chapter is all about dealing with our perfectionist tendencies yes so i know that you talk about grace under pressure and when we feel perfectionism is the most important thing we have a hard time dealing with the, the disappointment we have a hard time being graceful so what i talk about in this chapter what i learned when i was researching this is that there's actually three different types of perfectionism there is self-oriented perfectionism there's other oriented perfectionism, and then there's socially directed perfectionism. Now, socially directed obviously is like social media, other people telling us who we should be. And that's all so, so uh, affirming. So, well, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, social media is a wonderful, wonderful place, right? That is. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, that's just hell, hell. Um, yeah. so, so, and then other directed, other oriented uh, uh, perfectionism is leaders who micromanage who are demanding this perfectionism out of their team, but who are not really very supportive of them, but they've got these sort of outsized demands and that just creates strained relationships and unhappy people. Self-oriented perfectionism is fascinating because of the three, it's the only one that's actually even remotely productive and good for us. Self-oriented perfectionism is really the, the, um, it's really the, the intrinsic motivation that we have towards doing the thing that we care about. And, um, what I talk about in that chapter is, you know, the old expression, right? Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. So we have to understand that high performance comes with expectations, but we have to know that there are going to be times when things are not going to go well. And then how do we recast what we consider to be failure, right? Into a learning opportunity. Now, when I talk to, um, I talked to two different people in this chapter. One is Jonathan Fields, who's a you know very well-known uh, podcaster. And the other is Alex Ferreira, who is a, a gold medal winner and a, a, an Olympian, uh, X Games winner, do -door tour winner. He's the guy who goes up on the skis and does the like three, five different turns in the air and then comes back down in the half pipe, like aerial freestyle skiing. What's interesting about this is that there's no such thing as perfect. Because even if he does a perfect trick he comes down the next guy who goes up tries it also because they are literally inventing this brand new sport as they're doing it so you can never be perfect you can only just be 
perfect enough for today. And so he has to continue to redefine and redefine and redefine perfect by just deciding that he's going to outwork everyone else. And what he had to figure out is he had to figure out how to infuse his own style into what he did, because it's not just about being the person who would do the maximum tricks. It's about all the rest of the stuff around it. And knowing that, um, that, that, uh, it's going to take time and it's going to take good habits that are forming. So he never focused on the outcome of the event. He focused on the perfecting the habits so he could control the habits, knowing that that would take care of the outcome. I actually asked him, I was like, what do you think about when you're like at the top of the half pipe about to go? He was like, nothing. I was like, how can you think about nothing? Like, don't you want to be perfect? You have to out perfect everybody all the time. And he's like, no, he's like, I, I earned my medals in practice. I just picked them up on race day. That's that's a great thought. I like the way you t- uh, tied that into perfectionism, into habits. Do the best you can in your habits, and the outcome will be whatever it is. You can't control, really, you can't control yeah. it, right? Like, I mean, our yeah. books are coming out soon. Like, will they make bestseller lists? Will they get good media? Will people buy it? I don't know. I hope so. But what can I control? I can control writing the best book I can write. I can control doing the the deepest interviews I can do. I can control having conversations with great people like you, John. I can control, you know, only a certain number of things and I could do my best at those. But you know what they say, the very best you can do is just the very best you can do. Great. Now I'm going to put you on the spot again, yeah. um, uh, because your whole book is about developing oneself and then, uh, getting the, and then at the end you have this chapter called loop to loop, which I think is about doing it all over again. So are you absolutely crazy? <laughs> so, um, this was the conversation that I had with Whitney Johnson, who, um, you know, you know, you know, and I know, and Whitney is one of the greatest minds in, in management thinking. And Whitney was describing to me this idea of the S curve where when you're at the very bottom, you don't know what the hell you're doing. And then as you start coming up, you're like, okay, I'm going up to the top of the S. I think I know it's figuring I'm getting and I'm getting it. Yep. And then you get to the top and it's like, woo, everything is good. It's even smooth sailing. You got it. And she said, but if you stay up there too long, you start to self-sabotage. And I was like, no, that's crazy. Like who self-sabotage? Like you're like successful. Everything's good. I've made it. And she's like, no, no. And then she asked me to tell her a story about a time when I, uh, when I didn't prepare, when I mailed it in, when I got lucky, when I was working as a CEO of my search firm. And I was like, huh, I don't remember ever. Oh, wait a minute. And then I told her a story that I was like, you know, I did do that. I like, I, I was 10 years in and I, and I was going to do a, um, a family foundation search for like this scion of wall street. And I went to his penthouse, uh, uh, uh office of, you know, looking out over all of Central Park. And on the way up, I was like Googling him to do some research because I hadn't done it on, you know, I mean, it's story does not make me look good, right? And I hadn't done it. So we get up to the top floor and I had barely done any research, but I knew just enough to like fancy dance my way through this, 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 this pitch. And we got the work. Like we got, I got very lucky. Like I, you know, basically like called this guy in his BS. I, you know, was like, I like puffed up my chest and decided to like out wall street him. And we got very lucky. And on the elevator down, I texted my business partner and I'm like, I think it's time for me to go. Yeah. Because that would have been malpractice, right? Like I had been doing this work for 15 years at that point, five years with the big firm, 10 years with my own. I knew enough to dance my way around this, but that was not responsible to my team. It was not responsible to my firm. It was not responsible to my reputation. It was not responsible to him. And I told her that story and she was like, yep, you're self-sabotaging. And so the thing about when you get to the top of that S-curve is the decision is going to get made, whether you make the decision to move on to your next wonder how or the decision gets made for you. And if I hadn't had the self-awareness to make the decision myself and I had done it over and over and over again, eventually I wouldn't have gotten so lucky and things would have gone really, really poorly. You made your own luck. (laughs) Yes, I made my own luck. (laughs) Well, Laura, we can keep rocking and rolling, but you know, on this show, I ask everyone a story about grace. Do you have a something quick that you would like to share with us? You've integrated the concept throughout, but is there a particular story that pops to mind for you? So, yeah, um, I, you know, there are a lot of stories uh, throughout the book, and I think 
I think the one I would probably tell is Melissa Wiggins. Melissa Wiggins was um, was in the, in, in the East Wing of the hospital giving birth to twins while her husband was in the West Wing holding her four-year-old's hand while he was getting a cancer treatment. And this was not how she expected that day to go, right, by any stretch of the imagination. Her son, the four-year-old, is good. He's in remission. He's fine. But in that process, she realized that there were so many kids who were dealing with cancer and so many families who just – want more research and want more information. So she started a nonprofit. She built this nonprofit. She's worked her tail off to grow this nonprofit all to the detriment of her own family because she was so busy holding hands of kids who were dying and families who were grieving that she was having a hard time just keeping up at home. And she actually became a, a coaching uh, client of mine. And that's how I got to know her. Her story of grace is figuring out that she wasn't that important to the nonprofit that she founded. She was important to the fundraising. She was important to some of the families, but she wasn't that important to every single piece of it. And she had to understand, she had to have some grace with herself to understand that she wasn't that important to everything and that she had to figure out where she was in fact that important, both for work and for family and double down there and delegate everything else. What a beautiful story. And and I'm glad you mentioned the grace for oneself, because uh, too often we, we show it to others, but we don't give ourselves uh, that. And I know that's a theme throughout your book, yes. too, is give yourself a break. Show yourself some grace. Um, Laura, how can people find you? So Yeah. So all of my friends call me LGO. So I'm on all the socials at Hey LGO. And if you want to pick up a copy of Wonder Hell, I would love for you to do that. It's at wonderhell.com. Uh, and you can get all kinds of uh, goodies and bonuses if you order it there, or you can get it at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or anywhere fine books are sold. Great. Uh, Laura, it's been a joy to speak to you today. And uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom with us. And um, have a lucky day and an even more lucky launch. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> with that, we'll go out. So.